Cream. The power trio of Ginger Baker on drums, Jack Bruce on bass, and Eric Clapton on guitar really hit home with audiences in the West, particularly in the US when they first started to release music. And eventually they popularized a mix of blues, rock and psychedelic music in Europe too, with songs like White Room, I Feel Free, and the song that I thought I'd focus on in today's video, Sunshine of Your Love. It's a song that perfectly bridged the gap between pop, rock and blues, enhanced Clapton's reputation as a master of the guitar, and cemented their title and reputation of being a successful supergroup. In this video, we'll look at the band's early history, the song's composition, and the legacy it's left behind. Eric Clapton was born and raised in Surrey, England. Ever since he was little, he had a knack for painting and drawing. He got an acoustic guitar for his 13th birthday, but didn't start to play seriously until a couple of years later. It was when he heard a children's show on the radio that he got inspired to take music more seriously. The radio show played blues songs by Muddy Waters, Big Billy Brunsey, Blind Blake, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, and others. The blues made a deep impact on him, and so he decided to enroll at Kingston School of Arch. He took several trips to the cultural underground that is the Marquee Club in London and joined a myriad of local bands too. It seemed like the floodgates of music and artistic freedom were wide open for Clapton from this point onward. There's a lot more to be said about Clapton's background story, but to sum up his early career, he joined a series of bands in the 60s, some of them more successful than others. Perhaps the most notable ones in his early years were the Yardbirds and John Mayall and the Bluesbreakers. But if there was one band that stole the spotlight in the late 60s, it was Cream. Ginger Baker, a jazz drummer from South London, was the one who first came up with the idea of creating Cream. He wanted to gather the cream of the crop, so to speak, of contemporary musicians in order to reach fame and success. As things went downhill after his previous band, the Graham Bond organization, released their second album, he saw his opportunity to jump ship and start something new. Ginger and bassist Jack Bruce played together in the Graham Bond organization. They'd initially met each other when they played in Alexis Corner's Blues Incorporated, and although they had their tribulations in the past, Ginger decided to invite him and Eric Clapton to join Cream. The idea was to, to carry on the idea that I'd had with Graham and everybody was to do something that was going to be hugely successful. Now, the three guys shared a common interest in classic American blues music. But in Cream, they adopted a much more experimental version of blues. Their psychedelic mix of blues, rock and pop became extremely popular in the US and opened doors for the new blues acts in the UK and the rest of Europe. The band had a short-lived lifespan that only lasted from 1966 to 68, but in those few years they were able to create what we recognize today as some of the best rock music of all time. Even Jimi Hendrix loved Cream to the point where he covered several of their songs live. Well, I just stop playing this rubbish and uh, dedicate a song to the uh, Cream. So what was it that made their songs so good? I don't know why. I don't know why. There's probably not one good explanation for this. They were all exceptionally good at playing their instruments, they were all dedicated to the point of obsession, their timing was perfect, and they also took their fair share of uh, <clears throat> substances which might have affected a thing or two in the song making process. So there's not a good answer for how and why they made such a big impact, but there are three things I feel stand out. The first thing is that they effortlessly blend together genres. Secondly, and I'm probably biased <laughs> to say this because I am a guitarist, but I think Clapton is able to provide the highest tier of flaring riffs and blazing soloing here. And lastly, I think their success is due to how all of the instruments flow together so easily. Although it's clear that the entire band has musical influences from all kinds of directions in the song, I'd like to take a closer look at Clapton's riffs and the embellishments to begin with. The melody of Sunshine of Your Love uses the blues scale, 
which is basically the pentatonic scale with the added blues notes. The function of the scale is one flat three, four, five, and flat seven. And if you're allergic to music theory, what that basically means is that you play these notes. But you also add that note in between the fourth and the fifth, that blues note. Clapton is also a master at using the vibrato technique. This is where you bend the strings slightly back and forth to create a more vibrating and uh, pulsating sound. We know for a fact that Clapton was a huge B.B. King fan. They even made an album together in later years, which, you know, speaks for itself. Now, if we listen closely, we can hear similarities between the bends and vibrato techniques of Clapton and B.B. King. Check this out. So in some of his interviews, Eric Clapton has mentioned that his favorite album by B.B. King is Live at the Regal. It's an amazing album showcasing some of the best blues music out there. And the opening track, Every Day I've Got the Blues, shares some very big similarities in terms of the vibrato technique when compared to Sunshine I've Love. Just, just listen to this. So again, you have this fastness of the vibrato of B.B. King. And you can hear that speed, that speedy vibrato being echoed in the solo of Sunshine Every Love 2. So there's a huge blues influence here, but that's not all. Eric grew up listening to a ton of early rock and roll music from the 50s and early 60s and he was particularly captivated by the music of Chuck Berry. Although rock and roll was closely linked to blues composition in the 50s, Berry's double string phrasings offered the audience something new. If you were going to play rock and roll, or any upbeat number, and you wanted to take a guitar ride, you would end up playing like Chuck, or what you learned from Chuck. You know all this stuff that's, like, I was doing the double string stuff. Single lines, it doesn't sound right. It sounds thin or something, or too fiddly. It would be okay, but it wouldn't be as good as... So Johnny B. Good is Chuck Berry's most famous song, and it also has one of the best examples of this double string phrasing, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So that's the introduction to the rest of the riff and the song. But in the beginning, you can see that you have this. So you kind of, you strum two strings at the same time and then you slide both of them at the same time as well. And you can find that exact double string phrasing in the middle of the solo of Sunshine of Your Love as well. So there you have it again. So there you have it, Eric Clapton and Chuck Berry. A lot of bands fell into the underground of obscurity during the psychedelic 60s. But what kept Cream afloat and helped them become popular in the end was their pop sensibilities. Although Sunshine of Your Love was inspired by something Jack Bruce heard at a Jimi Hendrix concert, their way of promoting and crafting music was heavily influenced by the Beatles. I think the strength of the material was my desire to write very original music for uh, pop music. People that showed the way there were the Beatles with their fabulous singles, and we all wanted to emulate that, or at least I did, I know a lot of people did. But as time went on, the album became the thing as opposed to the single for bands like us. As he mentioned, they started out creating singles, songs that were specifically aimed at ranking high on the charts. But as they became more successful, they became more of an album band. But perhaps a more interesting part of this song is the composition. The song is composed and constructed like this. It has verse, chorus, verse number two, chorus number two, solo, verse three, chorus three. 
Now, a lot of songs from the 60s and 70s and even songs today have this exact same structure. But what throws a lot of musicians off and what threw me and my bandmates off when we were practicing the song was the fact that there was a difference in the length of the instrumental breaks in between each section. From the intro to when the first verse vocals come in, the instrumental break goes on for 32 bars. <laughs> But later in the song, between the guitar solo and the third verse, the instrumental break only lasts for 16 bars. I think the more traditional way of structuring the song would be to have the vocals just come in on the first beat after the solo has ended, for example. Or the alternative way of doing it would be to have, you know, an equal amount of, of space, of beats, of instrumental parts for each section. But again, this is just another example of the fact that Cream were really experimental and psychedelic. So again, the song is quite experimental. It blends together elements of blues, rock and pop with a flair of psychedelia. It stared the future right in the eyes during its release while also giving a respectful nod to the past. But it's not just the blending of genres that makes this song stand out. We have to remember that this band features one of the greatest guitarists of all time. And perhaps it's not too pretentious to say that this song's got one of the best guitar solos of all time? I don't know, I think so at least. This solo's got a bit of everything. Bends, double bends, hammer-ons, pull-offs and slides. It's slow and gnarly in the beginning, but fast and surprising near the end. Say whatever you want about my skills as a guitarist, I spent a good two weeks learning how to play this solo decently, and another two trying to smoothly play all the phrases in one run. It was challenging, but fun. In my opinion, it's one of the more fun solos you can learn as an intermediate player. Now, when the band first arrived on the music scene in 1966, Rolling Stone editor Jan Wenner described the band as a supergroup. This had to do with the fact that all the members came from bands that had been successful in the past. But because they were all well-versed musicians so early in their career, they had this incredible ability to communicate with each other musically. I think really what happened was that we found a niche that was independent of all of these all of these ideas that we individually had it was something that existed when the three of us played together and we would find a certain place where it was comfortable and where it had its own identity and we would subscribe to that and forget our own stuff i've been waiting so long i've been waiting so long i've been waiting so long Thank you so much for watching this video. Please check out these guys over here, Mari, Jonas, Martin, and Robin. These are some amazing uh, bandmates and friends of mine that helped me make this video come true. I also wanna make a comment on the fact that it's been a long time since I made a video on this channel. And the reason why I took such a long break was because I, I just needed a break, to be honest. I was kinda in the middle of a burnout and I didn't know what to do about nine months ago. I'm thinking of returning back to the channel again with this series. It's gonna be a little bit more guitar and uh, music theory oriented from now on. And I think you can expect at least two or three videos each month. So again, stay tuned if you like this and uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers.